Good morning, good afternoon, or good night. I'm your host, Adrian Conway. Welcome to another episode of Rise and Pod. This is an open edition. Um, this is officially my recap of the CrossFit Games 2024. Uh, I have been on the road, on the go for the last couple of weeks, quite a bit, teaching seminars, level two and level one, and also being a part of the 24.3 announcement show, which was a blessing. I loved it, loved every moment. Uh, of course, there's some drama surrounding it and the workout details getting released just before, which I had no idea about um, when, when I was there on site because I'm focused on, of course, my job and the things that I'm responsible for. And uh, I guess around the time that it was leaked that we were already that the show had been rolling. But of course, the workout hadn't been announced yet. Um, nonetheless, what a great time. What a great time the last three weeks has been. Now, not all of you listening to this or watching this will agree with me because you didn't end up where you wanted to be. Well, good for you. And I say good for you because it's me. I'm Coach Conway. And that is my job is to say good for you. Whether the results came out good, bad, or indifferent, my goal is to help you rise up and be better. Um, does that mean that in life we're always going to have the outcomes we intend? Nah. Does that mean in competition the outcomes that we train for are going to be optimized? Nah. And does it mean that just because we work hard, and we sacrifice and we train and we have great coaches or great programs that other people aren't doing the same kind of thing and are either more talented, have been doing it longer, um, maybe have gotten thrown a couple bones in regards to these workouts being wheelhouse workouts for them. No, nah, it don't mean that none of those things aren't going to happen and aren't going to be true because they are. You aren't on this journey alone. It's not you versus a static field of competitors. In fact, it's you against a dynamic field of competitors who all want desperately to improve just like you do. And they also, nah, scratch that. They might even want it more than you. I'm just going to keep it real. You think you want it a lot, but I meet a lot of people who want it a lot. And most people who think they want it a lot actually only think they want it a lot instead of actually wanting it a lot. They think they want to want it, but they actually don't know what having it would entail, and they don't want to live that life. They want like web liberty status. They want like more IG followers. They want stronger lifts so people would give them more likes and comment on their stuff. They want to be an influencer and sell products for people. They don't actually want like this solo, quiet, hidden grind that it takes to be a lead at anything. Some people think they want that, but they actually don't want that. And it kind of shows itself when people are like, oh, never mind. I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not going there yet right now on this podcast episode. This is about the open. It's not about me digging into the mindset or the lack thereof resiliency in the mind of many competitors. So let, let, also, also, here's another point, though. If you love CrossFit the way I love CrossFit, you want the methodology to grow. The whole reason that the games is real value to me is because it leads new people into the community. It leads new people into affiliates. It leads new people um, down the rabbit hole to chase this journey of being the fittest on earth. And to me, fitness and health are non-consequential. They're not at odds together. They work together. Um, ch optimizing your health will only can continue to push you forward to an elite level of fitness if when done right. My whole point with that is that we want the methodology to grow. So guess what? Every year we want the open signups to grow. And guess what, folks? The more people that sign up, the harder it's going to be for you to be successful. This is the way sports work, kids. Um, you can't just walk in now and be the hardest worker in the room and expect to be great at CrossFit. Sorry, not the way it's going to be. So take it on the chin if the open didn't go your way and take heart. Team, this open was not a fair test. This open was not a complete test. And this open is of no reflection of your overall fitness level because there are holes that we did not explore and there are things that we did not test. There, I said it. And it's true. And I think anyone that has spent some time within the community would agree. That's actually not even the purpose of the open this year. It's been quite established and quite resounded from the top down. I think Dave Castro has done a great job about expressing this, that we wanted this to be a community driven three weeks that any and everybody 
could partake in, participate in, be challenged in. We've got an RX category. We've got a scaled category. We've got age groups to compete in. We got we got the 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 first responders, the uh, the service uh, folks that get to compete against each other. We got the police force. We got the military. Like we we've got all these things tied back in. We've got the adaptive categories. This needed to be inclusive. It needed to be intense, and it needed to be fun. Yes, it got us all uh, in our feels uh, every time there was an announcement you know, a workout announced because we knew it was going to hurt and we knew it was going to hurt bad in order to create separation. You had to do the nuanced things that you probably didn't really want to do. Like jump your double unders faster, like transition faster to the rower, like go fast to the barbell, not take your time to shimmy and set up. And we were just hoping people were like, yo, is there going to be a max lift? There's got to be a max lift, right? There's got to be more than three scores. Um, or there's got to be maybe a two parter, right? Whatever it was going to be, but no team, there doesn't. And your journey in this space is likely not going to be linear. So that's my bit of a rant. I like to rant. I love the, love the methodology. I love the thing. I love the sport and I love athletics. I love competition and I love to watch athletes. I love to learn their mind and their body language. I love to see when people are about to falter and see when athletes are about to break through because of the way they choose to respond to difficult circumstances. Um, because there's always a time to pivot. There's always that 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 moment, that pivotal moment in, in a workout and a competition season in someone's career that I think really allows them to embark on a newfound level of a journey. And I think this this stage of this season is going to be that for a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of people who take this open on the chin and they're like, woe is me. I don't look as good as I looked last year. Woe is me. I didn't improve like I thought I would because I've been putting in the work this year. I'm not going to remind you anymore of the reasons that you shouldn't let this get you down. At this point, I'm going to say, go cry in the corner and be a whiner and complainer and fold the rest of your season. Don't even sign up for quarters, you baby. Because I'm done with it. I don't need to tell you that you can be great at the quarters because it's going to be a complete and thorough test. That's an assurance that I'm going to save my breath on. Because if you don't understand that about the methodology, if you don't trust that sitting where we're at right now, then you don't trust the powers at bay. You don't trust Dave and Adrian to be able to navigate the test and the team because there's other people that support them in such a way that they would allow the 40 fittest in each area for each semifinal to find the competition floor. And I trust that process. So where I'm sitting at right now, March 19th, 2024, I'm like, yo. Stress less and let's get focused on the next four weeks to top off our lifts, to refine our gymnastic skills and get ready to show them the freak off at quarterfinals. So that's my charge to you. Now, let's take some steps back because I didn't get an opportunity to break down my thoughts on 24.2. 24.2 was a 20 minute AMRAP of 300 meters on the rower. 10 deadlifts at 185 pounds for the men, 125 pounds for the women, and we finished each round with 50 double unders. Now, anyone who has fitness that is in the competitive conversation, this test was one of transitions and focus. There was no sheer limitation on the rower nor the deadlift for this to be a problem. What I mean by that is that, yes, there might have been some value if you could hold a 143 pace on the rower the entire workout, but only if you never messed up your double unders and only if you were aggressive and attacking, setting your rope up, setting your rope down, picking it up each round, that your barbell was only one and a half steps away from your rower, that all these things had to go right in order to make rowing a blistering pace justifiable or even needed. Because often what would happen to people is that they would sit down and say, coach, I'm going to row a 147. Awesome. Row the run 47. And with two mess ups on the jump rope, if only even for two seconds each time. So we're talking now four seconds. That 147 could have easily been slowed down to a 150 the entire workout. And now they would have still ended up perhaps with more reps. 
as you mature in your fitness journey or you come under the tutelage or mentorship of a good coach and a good leader, you will start to understand that a workout like 24.2, the trap is the rower, just like most workouts and most tests. It is important to utilize the rower, the bike erg, the ski erg, all these ergs as great ways to train fitness. It is completely another thing for you to assume that because you're a good rower, you're going to kill a workout like 24.2 because that would have trapped you there in thinking, let me exert all my effort on this rower so that I can just screw up everything else. And folks, when you screw up something that doesn't ride meters with momentum, that has that involves more stop and go and involves more taxing contractions to get work done than it does to sit and horizontally displace yourself front to back and pull on a handle then it's just more reflective of your time, both good and bad. So this is the reason that we had some elite women even beat some elite men output. And I say elite, meaning like, yo, there were dudes that were into their 11th round that got beat by women in our sport, and we rode the same distance. These dudes outweigh these women by 35 to 40 pounds, and, and they're getting beat in a workout where most of the time is spent on the rower. That's asinine and insane when you put the logic down on paper that way. I know they deadlifted less weight. They should have. In my mind, as a programmer, I would have also allowed them to row less meters. It's quite silly to me, and, and this is me being critical of the test here. And I would say the same thing to Dave out of all respect. And I would ask him where his thoughts were and why the purpose of this existed. If we scale weights, why are we not scaling an erg that is reflective of your body weight, you tra you travel zero distance. So if I weigh 300 pounds and I'm rowing on a rower, my mass will move that rower more efficiently than someone that's only 200 pounds. So my weight is an advantage here. My length is an advantage here. If I'm that big, right? If I'm six foot, 300 pounds versus I'm five, nine, 200 pounds. Now, of course, fitness will play a role in it eventually, but from we could say the same thing about the deadlift, but we still give women a different load on the barbell, but not a different standard on the meters. It doesn't make sense to me, um, which is why I think commonly we see it in calories and we see the difference in calories or we see, um, you know, a, a different output in meters on a rower. Rower a biker. Now running, hey, we can have this conversation about running too, but running, you physically displace your center of mass with every stride. So now it's more relative, pound for pound, height, all of that stuff is more relative because I have to move my mass through space. You have to move, move your mass through space. But on a rower and on a biker and on a ski arc, we are not doing any of that. I'm only rewarded for being heavier and bigger, period, bottom line. So again, that's me being critical of the test saying like, hey, I don't know exactly what the women should should be rowing as completely uh, at odds fairness, but I think we can figure that out over time quite easily. And I think I would start by simply prescribing the women at a 270 meter row and the men at a 300 meter row. Those are just those are just my takes, right? And that's that's slight. Some people would even argue more like 250. I think there's a happy medium there to be had. But what did we learn from 24.2 before I dive into 24.3 in the open at large is that the open at large, I'm sorry, 24.2 was a test that should have revealed to you some holes. And, and here, here are the two holes that I'm predominantly focused around. Pacing and your ignorance on how to emphasize what is important and what is not important. Because most people, again, rode too fast. And I'll even throw myself under the bus here. And, and a lot. And here, here's where you got to understand where I'm at in my career. A lot of what I choose to do is intentional ignorance. I try things so that I can share them with my athletes. I no longer put myself as a competitor on the forefront of my focus. When I do that, I'm a bit of a lesser coach. And I couldn't tell you why exactly. And I couldn't tell you how it works. And I'm sure there are people who are actually really good at this. I'm not. When I, when I visualize myself as an athlete, there's part of me who like clings tightly to things um, in regards to the ways I approach a workout, the things I think about a workout, the things I consider, the things I don't consider, the things I think that you're going to think that I will think differently. I mean, there's levels to the way my mind works and it, and it might even be undue. It might even be like unnecessary. But as a competitor, I grew up my whole life playing football and basketball. And the psychological advantage that I could create for myself over anyone was always one of my greatest superpowers. 
knowing what they were willing to do versus what I was willing to do. Um, it's how I became a starter on every team that I played on to comparing myself to, to greater athletes. I think I've, I always played with people who were more gifted than me and I always started over them. And a lot of it was because I knew how to navigate personal relationships, gain confidence from my coaches, show up at the right place at the right time to make the right play. Um, but like, I take this stuff into CrossFit and, and, and before I go on another rant there about like performance driven athleticism and mindset and psychological approach and all that great stuff. I want you to understand that like when I attack workouts, like I did 24.2, it was with a bit of intentional ignorance so that I could see how it would go. And I rode a little too fast folks. So I was a part of that crew that lollygagged a little bit at the double unders. I had a few mess ups, but not a ton, but enough that like I slowed myself down to get back to the rower. Cause I didn't really want to hold the pace that I was holding. And what I should have done was slowed the pace that I was holding. So that I'd been more aggressive in my transitions. It would have paid off for me. I would have actually finished 10 rounds instead of being shy, finishing 10 rounds. Um, but a lot of you should have an equal lesson to take from that. And you should understand that while, again, training ergs is important because of the fitness and the capacity that it can build, it should not be looked at in most competition style workouts. Again, most, most competition style workouts as the end all be all. In fact, it should take the backseat to almost all the transitions and all the other movements that will be present. So if there's a place where you could sit back and you can watch people go out way too fast and you can sit back and chuckle inside at your, and as you, as you laugh in your mind at these other fools that are going way too fast and you're just going to sit back and walk them down rich froning style on day three or day four at the CrossFit games to go one, 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 or something to win the CrossFit games. Um, you should be able to do that on a workout like this. So learn that lesson, take it in the row mattered, but it didn't matter as much as you thought. The other thing is that a movement like double unders isn't just about doing double unders. Hear me say it one more time. Doing a movement like double unders isn't just about doing double unders. It's not what you do. It's how you're achieving it. There is a virtuosity that is completely ignored in the form of jumping rope in our space enough that kind of makes me sick to my stomach. And I'm as guilty as anyone. Again, it takes one to know one, right? So when I say these things that are like hard teachings to you guys, it's because I first realized and seen them within myself or within my own coaching. And I even have athletes who jump far too high on their double unders and spin their hands far too slow, or they don't have the exact appropriate fit to their jump rope, or they don't have, and, and haven't explored and done the research and, accru and accrued the data to know exactly what type of jump rope optimizes their performance. And I should take that responsibility as their coach to tell them those things. And it's hard because there's so much to do in a sport like CrossFit. There's so much to be gained in a sport like CrossFit that something as simple as a double under when I have someone that has them, it can be overlooked. Team, I'm here to tell you that if you could stay low to the ground, spin your hands faster, finish 50 dumbbell unders in 23 seconds, instead of 27 seconds every round you ended up with about a 45 second advantage over the people who also went unbroken and just jumped a little higher 50 times on each round so when you consider virtuosity and you think in your mind this workout was about the rower 24.2 and this workout was about the deadlifts and this workout was about going unbroken on the jump rope Folks, it was not about those things. Yes, it was about those things to some. At the elite level, it was about pacing the row just right, not too fast. Hustling to the, to the deadlift. And for most of the world, not standing up all the way. Extend your hip and pull your shoulders back while your knees are straight. That's the top of a deadlift. But it wasn't about doing 50 double unders unbroken. It was about doing them as fast as possible for 11 rounds straight. That's where most people created time in the top 10% amongst each other. So keep this in mind as you move forward. Allow 24.2 to be a great lesson. There were people out there saying really stupid things like, the deadlift bar should have been heavier. Smack yourself because it would have been a completely different workout. I listened to Dave Castro's Week in Review, 
and people are like, well, you know, I'd really like this at 225. No one cares what you would have liked. It's like what I really want to do is have a session where I ask people things and like don't respond at all, but just play the sound of the rock. Like just being like, hey, so what weight would you like the deadlift to be? And then them start to speak and then be like, it doesn't matter what weight you want the deadlift to be, right? Again, because it's a test. Team, the team, HQ comes out with a test. Just save more of your opinions about the test and like what you thought about it to yourself if it's always just like this ignorant pouting because you don't like the flavor. Like you're going to eat. You're going to play, so you're going to eat. So complain less about it. Eat and improve your fitness so that you can get good at whatever test and whatever flavor it is. I'll just never understand it. But anyways, let's go on to week three. Week three, we get going. I'm I'm at Proven HQ. What an ex amazing experience um, that that was to be a part of an open announcement. I've done a lot of things in the media space in the last two years with CrossFit, which I'm fortunately very blessed to do. I love the sport, clearly. I, 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 I research the sport. I am curious about the sport. I coach the sport. I do the sport. Um, but I really love the methodology. So to be at Proven HQ, to see the community that they're building, adjacent to the competitive nature of proven right like so tia is the fittest woman in history she's the fittest human in history um shane the fittest coach or i'm sorry not the fittest coach necessarily the uh the most successful coach in our sport they have of course uh, elite influence but it's cool to see what they're trying to do from a day-to-day -day community and methodology thing down there in nashville and it'll certainly be a place i stop into town when i'm traveling through that that state whether i'm on my way to cookville to teach level one or whatever um, they're going to build a great community. I'm very confident about that. Nonetheless, 24.3 is or was five rounds for time of 95 pound thrusters, 65 pound thrusters, 10 reps, 10 chest to bar pull ups, rest one minute, then five rounds for time of 135 pound thrusters, 95 pound thrusters for seven reps, then seven bar muscle ups. And that was that back half was also five rounds for time, or you got capped at 15 minutes. You had to take the one minute rest in between. What a trap of a workout team. What a trap. I mean, we watched elite athletes take this on and they kind of tried to pace it, but they went hard because it was a live announcement show. And that's what they should do. They put on a show for all of us, but like people watching them do it still just didn't even understand like, wow, you should really go slow on the first five rounds. Like, like intentionally break it up and go slow, go real slow. Go slow, slow, right? Go slower than you think you needed to go. I love this test because of the trap that exists playing off of our emotions and playing off of our adrenaline, just like a lot of times the open does and a lot of times any test does. Again, there's such a lack of awareness and humility within our space that people just think they're fitter than they are. They think thrusters are going to not affect them the way that they do. They're going to think that their grip won't be as blown up as it will. It's like, again, always blows my mind. Eat your humble pie, go slower so then you can win. That's it. That's how simple it is. Break up stuff in a way that seems ignorant. I would rather you go too slow early and sell your soul at the end in almost a sprint effort and then be like, dang, next time I'm going to do it, I'll go a little faster. Cool. Versus blowing completely up, trying to be someone that you think you are, but that's someone that you actually are not, like elite. elite not elite, because I know most of you listening to this are actually pretty elite. Anyone that's in the top 10% in the world and anything's quite elite, but like elite, elite. Um, and like just overpacing ridiculously. So then you can go a little more smooth on the back half and not even try as hard and then beat people who are trying really hard and they're dead. I think that's like my favorite part about the sport is watching people do that. Now, if you're worth your salt, you're still going to be riding the threshold and capacity the last three rounds of the ten, of the seven and seven anyways. And it would be miserable folks. And I know anyone that finished this workout, it was, felt quite miserable to everybody. Um, but again, the lessons come down to more than anything, not just raw capacity at the top. It, it was more about like, how'd you play it? How'd you lean your foot on the gas? How'd you take it off? How'd you hit the brake? How'd you not? Right? So I, I loved the open. So now adding this test in, right? Adding this test in, we had two couplets. Okay. The week one. 24.2 or 24.1 involves the gymnastics in the form of burpee. And that is a gymnastics movement, folks. I'm not sure why 
Some people don't consider this a gymnastics movement, but when you do it fast, it is an, a plyometric push-up. In fact, we should be divvying out burpees with more caution to the everyday athlete than we do because there are people that try to do fast burpees and they can't even do quality push-ups. And so now we're adding 3x the load by having them flop down on the ground and get up quickly. And that's a whole nother question or a whole nother topic that we can discuss in the future. Um, but you need to build capacity in horizontal pressing and holds before you just start doing 150 burpees in a workout. Just my personal opinion. Anywho, the other movement there was weightlifting in the form of a single arm dumbbell snatch. I like this because it was unilateral. We did not switch every rep. It was a light load for most of the community that could cycle it fast. I know it wasn't light for everyone, and that's okay, but it was light at the competitive level, and we burnt down, and we died there, and it was awful. And uh, most elites were doing it anywhere between six and eight minutes. 24.2 was a triplet. That means it involved three movements. And it was a monostructural piece in the row, which means something that is highly cyclical or highly repetitive for a long period of time. Doesn't have to be, but it, it could be the row. You could just do that deal. Um, monostructural metabolic conditioning is, is how we would categorize the row. Then we had a, another weightlifting movement in the form of a deadlift, which was light for, again, the folks who were doing nine plus rounds. Even eight plus rounds, it was light for them because of the way that they were cycling it to get that kind of work. So a, a, good, a good bit of us. And then we had another monostructural metabolic conditioning in the form of a double under. A little bit more skill involved there, but it could be repeated for a long time. Okay. And we went for 20 minutes. So this is going to be on the longer side. This is us getting outside of the traditional means of, of 10 to 12 or 10 to 15 minutes, which a lot of CrossFit methodology is going to be kind of like that lactate glycolytic uh, training window. And we went a little bit more on the aerobic side for 20 minutes, which was great. I thought it was still a, a fine way to test. I thought it was still convenient to do it. Not too hard to set up, not too hard to get warm for, right? If you think about class management and using it from a, an affiliate standpoint, I thought this open was very friendly that way. And then week three, it kind of was two parter, right? Because it went from less complex, less load to more load, more complex. I can always appreciate that. Yeah, give us a level system or a tier system. Now, was it undue load and undue skill? No, which I loved, right? So it was like, hey, the everyday member could perhaps get through the five rounds if they were fit enough and then could perhaps get through seven thrusters. And then maybe they were going to meet their their means of fitness at the at the bar muscle up. And if that was the case, that's all good because then they'd already done all that work. It was a great workout up until that point. And maybe they're going to set a PR by getting their first bar muscle up. Maybe they set a PR with the thrusters to get through one or several thrusters. But it was again, and, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm repeating it, but I want to write it down so I can just look at this as a diagram here. Five rounds for time, 10 thrusters, 10 chest to bar, one minute rest. So we even get a, we introduce some rest intervals, which is again, again, another unique consideration, both with training and with testing, because it, 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 uh, it tests overall work capacity and recovery levels, which I always love. Um, five rounds for time, seven thrusters, 135, 95, and then seven bar muscle ups. Now, taking a look at the leaderboard here maybe i thought i had it pulled up here okay taking a look at the leaderboard yonikoski i don't think this is official but he did it in 803 just absolutely disgusting almost to do that workout in seven minutes is wild team it's wild um which you know, I, I, I got on my pedestal and told everybody, yo, break it up early, break it up early, rest, rest, rest. This man didn't do that. This man's fit enough in his local muscle stamina and his legs, his arms and his grip and in, in his cardiorespiratory stamina and, and endurance to be able to go hard on both sides, both ends. Um, 
Jay Crouch went 855. It looks like he redid it because I want to say he was just over nine minutes on, on site and in person. Saxon Panchik went 824. And these the reason I'm reading these names is right now as it stands, these are the top three in the open. Yonikoski with 30 points overalls first and overall overall placings. And listen to his data. My man went 27th in the world on 24.1. Went he went second in the world with 995 reps on 24.2. And now he's sitting in first with 24.3. Um Saxon went 25th, 6th, and 8th. And then Jay went 13th, 26th, and 25th. Um, and then Luca Voonjak, whom I am unfamiliar with, went 22nd, 55th, and 4th. Very impressive. And Noah Olson sitting in 5th place overall, which I'm not surprised. He's riding high and feeling good. Body's probably feeling real nice um, because he's going team. There's a little less pressure for him to train at high volume. And he's going to be able to get stronger training like this, I think, with more intensity, with more recovery. And you'd be surprised, but I bet no, Mr. Mr. Olson might be the fittest we've ever seen him at the CrossFit Games. This tends to happen when athletes go from training individually um, and training for a team because there's less psychological insecurity. And what I mean by that is a lot of times these individual athletes, they put pressure on themselves and it's undue pressure. Um, because they want to be great, but it's all on them. And they, they make themselves feel like they need to train more. Um, it, which stresses them, that stresses their physio physiology, and it stretches stresses their psychology because they're literally trying to do the best they can to optimize their individual fitness. Now, Noah's still going to be on that type of journey, but he's going to do it with less pressure. He got a team, he got Tola, he got the girls, and the energy domains and time domains that they're going to be tested and are going to be slightly different, more on the shorter side. And when we train with more power, with more intensity, and with greater rest, periods, I think we can see Noah show up perhaps the healthiest he's ever showed up and the strongest, which leads you to always consider, are we always training individuals the right way? And how do we strike this balance? And I ask myself that on a daily basis as I oversee the development of many athletes. So um, bear with me here as we just took a look at the men's leaderboard just to take a look. But um, the reason I wanted to do that was just to kind of see and talk through some of the top times in the world on the men's side, and then we'll do the same thing on the women's side. Um, let's see here. I'm going to pull up the, oh my gosh, Rebecca Fusile is sitting at first place overall on the women's side for 24.3 specifically at 7.52. Now, there's not a video that's available to watch for her, um, but holy moly, that is beating second place by right now who is Mirjam Van Roor and she's about she's sit, sitting with which first of all here's what I want to say about Mirjam Van Roor her 24.1 video is available and her 24.3 workout is available to see and she's only accrued 40 points she's in second place over on the open with two of the three workouts available to just watch hey that's doing it that's making a statement Danielle Brandon, the same way. She's in 12th overall, and you can see her 24.1 and 24.2. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if she posts 24.3 also. But that's neither here nor there. Um, I can't believe that Fusier did it that fast, and I can't wait to hopefully see some video evidence of this. That's amazing. Um, but nonetheless, team, I, I here, here's my take. I want to reset. My reset is this, that... Uh, and, and I, and I know I went through 24.1 and 24.2, 24.3 was of course, weightlifting and gymnastics categorically. It was the one weightlifting movement that went up in load, but it was two separate gymnastics movements. So it was technically a triplet. Um, so we had a couplet and two triplets. We had a variety of time domains. We had a variety of loading as some people in the world were considering the 135 and 95, a little on the heavy side, uh, elite athletes were not, it just got heavier. Um, and it was relatively low skill. The fruit was low hanging this year compared to last year where we had strict gymnastics. We had a one rep max and a thruster. So, and we had heavy snatches. Shoot. We had heavy snatches. So last year was very different, but again, I want to urge and remind you the, the open is an incomplete test. It's the beginning stages of the qualifying process to the CrossFit games. It's quite complete in regards to this. At a local affiliate, I would argue that the fittest person at their gym probably is reflective of the leaderboard at this point. The loads got heavier through week three. The skills got higher. We went long. 
we went relatively on the shorter side. You, we hinged, we squatted, we pressed. We didn't get upside down at all. And we did a relatively high volume of hanging, even just in one week alone. So I would love to hear from you if you disagree with this, that most affiliates, the day-to-day -day members, the fittest rose to the top because the test was thorough enough for that level of competition. What it wasn't thorough enough for were those of you who are top 10% in the world and those of you who are looking to be one of the top 1% to make it to semifinals. So stay hungry. Don't be overwhelmed. The open is done and you need to let it go. I believe our good friend Elsa would say it something like this. Let it go. Let it go. The open's only three weeks long. Let it go. Let it go. Put on a smile, don't let your face be long. That's enough. And you're welcome. Team, good luck in quarterfinals. Uh, that's the end of my rant. That's the end of my take on where we are here in our season. Um, I, I like all the workouts. I'm not one to be critical of the tests. I just want to do my best to respond to the way things are going so that I can support my athletes the best that I can and continue to refine my understanding for what the programmers are doing. So I always try to be more curious than I am critical as things get released because optimally my opinion until one day I'm on that team that helps to decide the outcome of the CrossFit games and the test and its validity in which it's presented then my opinion doesn't really matter. So I'll keep it closer to my chest and I'll also share it more in private if those oppor opportunities ever come. But my one critic about this open was the rowing distance. I uh, just a little curious on why it's the same, why they don't tweak it on the, for, from, and, and what I'm, again, I'm alluding to the meters for 300 meters row for men, 300 also meters for women. Um, other than that team, it was a fun open experience. Your boy pulled his quad uh, yesterday. And I did it while I was in Nashville. I got off the flight, uh, my trip down there on Tuesday, and I hit a workout, and I strained it a bit doing thrusters with dumbbells. And uh, I was like, cool, I'm going to rest. I'm not going to do this workout till Monday. It felt good. I demoed all weekend at a level one. I was able to do thrusters to show, empty barbell, of course, and then even like some light ones at 95. But it was just demo. It was a couple reps, and I did them pretty cautiously. I did med ball squat cleans, and I did hang power cleans in a, in a real training piece that I did. I rode. I skied. I biked. I did a bunch of stuff in training, but I never squatted at all um, at intensity. I got prepped and warmed for, up for the workout. And uh, three thrusters into 135 in my warm-up, I felt a little pop. And I was like, okay. I want to do this workout, though. I don't want to completely be done for the season if perhaps I want to just go through quarterfinals. And um, and, and I had I had asked someone to come judge me and help me out. I was still out of town. I was at Rushmore CrossFit. Shout out to Trey and the affiliate that she runs there. Um, amazing affiliate. If you guys ever pass through South Dakota, um, you know, go see Mount Rushmore, take your family there on a vacation, Rushmore CrossFit, go visit them. It's a great place. Um, and they have all access. You could drop in there any time of the day or night. So this is, this is my take is like, if I'm there with my family and I don't want to lose family time, but I want to get it in and go in the gym and grind, I could do it in the evening. I can do it early in the morning when they don't have a class going on and you can get access to do that. So great affiliate there. Always awesome to have those type of opportunities and experiences when you travel. Um, but I, I was grinding through my thrusters at 95 pounds. And on the second uh, round, I felt two pops in my quad and I knew it was all bad. So I stood there, I posted it to my Instagram stories yesterday and uh, it was, it was, it was painful, but I knew once adrenaline was gone, it was going to be more painful. So I kept going and kind of just really leaned into my right leg. Not a smart choice folks, but I just wanted to get through five rounds. So I took my time, finished five rounds, shut it down. And now I'm trying to recover. Um, I'll be going to the gym to work out though. I'm hitting the garage. I'm going to get a, get some training in. I'll, I'll, I'll exhaust my upper body efforts and uh, 
I'll even try to do some hinging and do what kind of contracting I can on this quad so I don't lose so much atrophy because I know I'm not going to be able to. I can't even really walk up and down the steps on that leg right now, um, but it'll get better quick. And uh, this is a reminder to you that everybody's dealing with something. Everybody gets banged up and uh, you see me smile on my face. I'm going to figure it out. My body's resilient. I, I, I'm good to it. So I hope that it recovers pretty quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys hopping in on this episode. If you've listened to it through this point, um, I appreciate you. Thanks for dealing with my nonsense and riffraff. Uh, you know, it's that time of year where I'll start to tune in more often and more consistently. Um just with giving my thoughts on the season, things that are going to continue to unfold uh, updates, even on athletes. Uh, not that I coach necessarily, but that I see doing things in the space um, because, you know, staying in tune helps my commentary. If I get that opportunity at the semifinals and at the CrossFit game. So nonetheless, team appreciate you. Um, if you are looking for guidance and or, and or help, I want you to be aware this is a great time to reach out for me, reach out to me. Um, as we'll be beginning a new off season very soon for most of the world at this, and after this next stage here, um, you know, only 25% advance. And after this next stage, the most majority people of the world are already going to be thinking about 2025. They're already going to be thinking about competing in off season competitions, like iron games, like water in the fall, like water in the winter, like, um, master's fitness collective, like everything that, 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 that there is that exists to throw down in. And there's no better time to connect yourself with a brand like true true fitness um or a coach like myself or someone on my staff that we can work with you on a one-to-one -one relationship so feel free to use the link below if you're watching this episode on youtube and or use the link in the show notes to schedule a call with us if you're curious um, about what the one-to-one -one relationship would entail there are limited slots of course um, but i've got a few available currently and uh, I'll be opening up a few more specific slots for nutrition coaching alone. I've been bitten by the bug to really help people specifically with their nutrition. So this relationship would not be about training. This relationship would be about me helping guide you um, with your food choices and giving you some options and um, helping you with your consistency and compliance. I want to go through a bit of a kickstart um, for some folks who are looking to have a three-month commitment and really do some strong transformations in their habits and lifestyle. And then of course it will reflect themselves in their body, but more to come on all of that. We do have a new track that's going to be available. We'll be launching sometime at the end of April for true, um, which I think a lot of people will enjoy as well. It's going to be that hybrid model. That's a tier between group general programming and one-to-one -one programming. So more details coming on that, but folks, hopefully you enjoyed the open. If this was your first open, congrats. Great job. If this was your 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th open, congrats. Great job. Keep going one day at a time. And uh, most importantly, you know what I'm going to say. Keep rising.